Entering this matchup with lowly Indiana, whose head coach Tom Allen is probably going to be fired, or more politely, let go. That's probably what Indiana University will say is Tom Allen has parted ways, quote-unquote, with the program. Anyway, Penn State entered this game with the number one defensive passing efficiency rating, and they gave up a 90, 69, and 26-yard touchdown pass, all from Brendan Soresby, who went 13 of 19 for 269 yards, three touchdowns, and one interception. Drew Aller also passed for three touchdowns, and he threw his first ever career interception. Man, oh man, this was a weird game on so many levels. And on so many levels, there are some concerns for Penn State moving forward. However, sometimes pressure and adversity produces great things. Welcome back, fellow football fanatics. It's your host, College Football with Sam, and I don't know what to tell you. Indiana outgaining Penn State in total yards. Indiana looking like the more competent passing attack. I know that there were several calls, whether it was Manny Diaz's fault or the player's fault for being out of position. I really don't know. But all I can say in short is that this defense has so much pressure on it because of the offensive ineptitude. Their margin for error is near zero. If you were stunned by the Indiana Hoosiers' performance, please hit that big red subscribe button and click the notification bell so you can get notified when I release more content and reaction videos like this. This is the best Big Ten YouTube channel in existence right now, and we have a goal to hit 20,000 subscribers by the end of the college football season. And with your help, we can totally do that. So if you're an Indiana fan, hit the subscribe button because it's red, much like your school colors. And if you're Penn State, hit that subscribe button and click the notification bell as well because you were stunned by Indiana. Indeed, Penn State, this defense is very aggressive. They love to get after the quarterback and they still had success. I mean, Indiana only had 24 minutes of possession. Penn State was rabid on the defensive side of the ball. They collected three sacks, four tackles for loss, a pass deflected, and they stuffed Indiana at the line of scrimmage several times. Indiana only rushed for 2.4 yards per carry, and it was really in the, I think, second quarter, third quarter, I vividly remember the fourth quarter, where Indiana at times was able to run on Penn State, but Penn State did a good job for much of this game stopping the run, but with the threat of the pass, Brendan Soresby just coming alive out of nowhere, um, Penn State had to change up their defensive scheme, obviously, and do some things differently. Before we resume, please comment your thoughts and your reaction to this game down below. What do you think went wrong? Do you think that Penn State needs to improve offensively, which I think we can all answer yes to that question. Do you think that the defense just had a fluke game, they were overlooking Indiana, or Manny Diaz just had three or four bad calls, all of which Indiana had good calls to match up with? What do you think happened? What do you think needs fixing? What impressed you from both sides of the football? I know that with Indiana, this was their chance. They were in this game. This game was tied in the fourth quarter. This was Tom Allen's chance to come out and get a win that could save his job, and I think he's done. Against Michigan, Indiana went up 7 to nothing. They came out slinging. Well, Michigan pretty quickly put them away. Indiana competed with Ohio State to open up the season, but Ohio State's defense was too good and honestly too conservative to allow any type of big play, and they suffocated Indiana from the get-go. Indiana hung around for a long time here, and it took Drew Aller finally delivering an accurate pass, finally delivering a deep shot, and it took Penn State's pass, pass rush to get home once again, sacking Soresby, and that ball continued to roll backwards due to a variety of players, Penn State and Indiana, trying to recover it for a safety, which is why you get 33-24. 
my Patreon. I post on my Patreon my power rankings and my predictions for my power rankings. It did not get this game right. Um, Potential Power predicted Penn State to win by well, well over 30 points, well over the 31 point spread. I think it predicted Penn State to win somewhere in the 40s, like 45, 46, 47, 48 points. I don't exactly remember, but if you want weekly picks against the spread or straight up, or you just want to see my power rankings, make sure to check out my Patreon page via the link in the description. Uh, This was actually, I think, its roughest week, but we will have more information on that in a community post. We didn't get a community post out last week, but we'll have more information out on that. There might be some things that I have to tweak in regards to the power ranking system, because this week was... It was rough in terms of picking the spread. In terms of picking games straight up, for top 25 matchups, it was pretty good. But more on that if you join my Patreon as an All-American or Heisman member, or follow the community section. But getting to this game, I mention that because Penn State entered as a 31-point favorite. I expected Penn State to come out and annihilate Indiana, and I didn't have a lot of time last week. And I wanted to cover games that I thought would have a large amount of attention drawn to them. More importantly, games that actually mattered. This game was not going to be any of those. Because in my mind, what is James Franklin good at doing? Well, he's good at beating teams that are just below Penn State's level or worse. Indiana is definitely one of those. Look at last year. Penn State's team last year after they get humiliated by Ohio State at home in a fourth quarter showing that was awesome by Stroud, Stover, Igbuka, Tui Moolau, Marvin Harrison Jr., etc. I think they faced Indiana the following week, or maybe they had a bye, I don't know. It was the first week of November, I think they played the Hoosiers, and Indiana just destroyed, like flat out killed Indiana. I expected the same thing here, and it was not that. It was not that whatsoever. Again, like I mentioned earlier, this was a game well into the fourth quarter, and it was so interesting looking at Penn State because toward the end of the matchup, when it was 24-24, Penn State didn't look like they were taking this game seriously, which indicates to me that they were sleepwalking through this matchup. Maybe the concerns here are almost null and void outside of what we already knew about this team entering this matchup. But Michigan is still two weeks away. Penn State has a road trip to Maryland. I can't imagine they were overlooking Indiana for Maryland. Maybe they were overlooking Indiana for Michigan. I don't know. But the secondary went from being first in the country in defensive passer efficiency all the way down to sixth because Brendan Soresby had a greater than 200 passer rating. He had a 228.9 passer rating, and he had a 79.8 quarterback efficiency rating, which is just crazy. Those are season highs, I believe, for Brendan Soresby, especially in regards to the passer rating. The 90-yard touchdown pass and Donovan McCulley's long reception, and also even the Omar Cooper Jr. 26-yard pass Indiana receivers had separation, whether it was on busted plays, whether they, they just straight up beat their man. It, it was it was unreal to watch. And the fact that Penn State pulled away is something that, A, I wanted to happen. As a Michigan fan, I want Penn State-Michigan to be a top 10 game, and the Big Ten needs to be strong. And B, Penn State's just more talented This team also isn't as bad as the 2021 team, which the 2021 team, I can imagine, would have found a way to lose this matchup. But this team's more akin to the 2022 Penn State team than the 2021 Penn State team. There is some mental toughness with this Penn State team. There is some physical toughness. They have a lot of talent. And even with Aller's inaccuracies, and I mean, I I watch him play. And a Penn State friend of mine puts it best. Aller isn't accurate and he needs a lot of work, but the staff the, the staff doesn't trust him. And it's understandable why they don't, because again, circle back, 
accuracy issues, but you got to give him some breathing room and let him make mistakes and grow because what Penn State does with Aller is they either put him in the, the complete spotlight and they ha- they put everything on his back for them to win, which is too much, or they try and be super conservative limit him from making any kind of significant plays, and then you get this lethargic uh, Iowa-looking offense, and it's it's gross. Penn State has no business having an offense that is this slow. They don't. It's really, whether it's a welfare version of Ohio State's offense this year or it's straight-up comparable to 2021 Iowa's offense, I don't know which is the better comparison, but Keandre Lambert-Smith is a playmaker, and he can beat guys one-on-one. He's fast. He's athletic. Over the previous two seasons, he hasn't been this super consistent wide receiver number one, but he's been a deep threat, and you saw that yesterday against Indiana on that final 57-yard pass from Drew Aller, and I imagine that's something that helps Drew Aller's confidence. Drew Aller on the season has had long passes of 72, also to Lambert Smith against West Virginia, and then 33, 35, 30, 34. He really doesn't throw the deep ball, despite the fact that he has ridiculous arm strength, potentially unmatched arm strength in the Big Ten. His deep arm has not been showcased, and a reporter foolishly asked James Franklin at one point, why don't you, you know, heave it deep? And James Franklin famously replied that, you know, quote-unquote, somewhere, my skin is curling thinking about that. And that's understandable because Aller has only completed 61.4% of his passes. He's not even averaging seven yards per pass attempt. The scheme is meant to have a lot of short completions, short to medium runs. I mean, Penn State wants to be this physical bully ball team. Well, when Aller's been sacked 11 times and the only offense with a hint of a pass rush that they faced is Ohio State in Illinois, and Illinois really has only one X-factor player and the rest of the d- defensive line is questionable at times, and Ohio State's very conservative, and Indiana was able to sack Aller three times, get several tackles for loss, Penn State on the day only averaged 3.1 yards per carry, and Indiana had six tackles for loss. This offensive line is good. It's above average. It's not great. It's not near elite. It's not elite. And its upside, outside of Olu Fashanu, very questionable. Meanwhile, Lambert Smith, I know that he doesn't have receivers that are at his level surrounding him, but Singleton's good out of the backfield. Lambert Smith is a receiver who... Look, I'm a Michigan fan here. I'm not saying that Lambert Smith would start at Ohio State, but if I could get Lambert Smith at Michigan, that would make me smile. It's, it's, you know, a weapon, a a capable wide receiver who can burn you deep, who's a great route runner. He led his team in receptions again. I mean, he is by far the number one target for Aller. He's being used by Aller in the same way that Marvin Harrison Jr., is being used by Kyle McCord. Right now he has 43, 43 receptions over eight games, 550 receiving yards. He's averaging 12.8 yards per reception as opposed to 15.3 and 16.2 in 2021 and 2022, and he has four receiving touchdowns. I, I don't know if I'm correct in this, but it might be a good idea for Penn State to not heave it up every single play because the reporter asking that question in my mind is I'm thinking what are you doing why are you asking that question I mean this is not NCAA 14 where I can call four verts and just change one of the routes every other place to confuse an AI defense or even my friend's defense and drive down the field in 30 seconds especially with the new clock rules, especially with defenses adjusting, responding with the 3-3-5, the 4-2-5, and especially in a conference like the Big Ten where defensive players love to come to the Big Ten and Big Ten defensive coordinators and defensive staffs are elite at developing their players 
offensively not exactly the same. So offenses are kind of put at a disadvantage, especially in offense like, for example, Mike Yersich's, and typically more of a spread or quicker paced offense. Penn State has a faster paced offense than Ohio State's or Michigan's this year, for example. When the weather gets cold, when the muscles get tight, not relaxed, um, that can, it has a little bit of effect. Like things begin to compound on top of each other. So I understand that if you're Franklin, if you're Yursich, you can't, you, know, you can't run a wide open offense with the personnel you have in the conference you play with the talent you have. The only schools who can run a wide open offense is Ohio State every year because they have the talent, they recruit at that level, they have the schemer, and Michigan occasionally. Michigan this year has enough experience, athleticism, and they also have the strength and conditioning coach to where they could run a, run a wide open, um, fast paced, like, you know, strike, hit, I'm not hitting on the right words to use, but they could run an elite offense that's like out of the spread or that's that's meant to score a lot of points, not necessarily a bully ball offense that just happens to score a lot of points like Michigan ran last year. Lambert Smith's a great player, and I think that maybe targeting him more deep and just trying that could work well. But then again, I don't know. Speaking of future games, Michigan's defense, their one weakness, I think, is allowing big plays through the secondary. Lambert Smith can definitely target that. He had six receptions for 96 yards and a touchdown. And I watch Penn State's offense, and I've watched Indiana too, against Ohio State, against Michigan. Rutgers hung 31 on them by only rushing the football. Penn State's offense, there is something wrong with it. it. It does not function even close to peak efficiency. Whether it's development, whether it's strength and conditioning, I have no clue. I really don't. Rutgers is able to run the football better than Penn State. That's heresy given the talent disadvantage. That should not happen. Michigan is able to run the football better than Penn State. Ohio State, when they have Travion Henderson, better rushing offense. Iowa, when their running backs and offensive linemen are healthy, probably tight ends are healthy too. I'd say better rushing offense. Wisconsin with a healthy running back room, better rushing offense. Minnesota, better rushing offense. A lot of this circles back to the offensive line. The running back room is still one of the best in the country. The problem is the offensive line, there's something functionally wrong with it. It's better at pass block than it is at run block. But they, it, let me in. The, let me know in the comment section below what you think is up with this offense. Because, in theory, I thought that in the preseason, Aller would come in, he'd show upside, he'd also show his downside, and he's done that so far this year. But I thought that at least for Penn State, their run game would be like it'd be good. Like, and by good, I mean even better than last year. I thought the offensive line would be better than last year. I thought that the wide receiver core would take a step back. Same with quarterback at times. But I projected Aller to be a top 25 quarterback. The offensive line to probably be a top 25 offensive line. And the running back room I had top three. Number three in the nation. No part of Penn State's offense has lived up to even the expectations I set in the preseason which were considerably lower than the expectations the national media set. Aller was being treated like a better quarterback than Kyle McCord. The running back room rightfully was being praised. I was on that hype train, and in large part because of the offensive line, it just hasn't materialized yet. Lambert Smith is one of the better players right now on this offense. Target him more. Use him more. Do whatever you can to get him wide open, to scheme him in game. Because having a reliable receiver will help Aller grow and continue to develop. I mean, he was, once again, missing open receivers, wildly overthrowing guys. He did a good job escaping the pocket a few times. I really like his pocket awareness and also how powerful he is as a runner. I mean, he's averaging like six, seven carries per game. That includes sacks, obviously, but 
using him and, you know, I love how they use him with quarterback sneaks. Speaking of which, they tried a quarterback sneak once and then didn't get it against Indiana, which speaks to Indiana's good defensive line, but also the issues on the offensive line for the Nittany Lions. Speaking of defensive line and the Hoosiers, I want to talk about Tom Allen and zone in on Indiana because we've talked a lot about Penn State mainly because they still have a story to write. Penn State can go out. They can beat Michigan. They can win all the rest of their games. And if they go 11-1, and one, depending on how the West shakes out, even though Illinois is probably going to finish with a losing record, Northwestern, I imagine, will lose more games. And I think Iowa, given how bad their offenses, will lose more games. It's looking like Michigan and Ohio State could finish with the better standing, the cross-divisional standing, which puts Penn State at a significant disadvantage in regards to a possible three-way tiebreaker in solving that. But in 11-1, and Penn State will be in the playoff conversation. And if not, it'll still be the best regular season record James Franklin's ever had. And if they win a New Year's Six Bowl game, they get 12 wins in a season. A 12-1 and Penn State season, um, that would make the best season since the Joe Paterno era in probably some games in the middle 2000s, or some seasons, rather, in the middle 2000s, like the 11-1 and season in 2005. Penn State still has a chapter to write, and James Franklin, nowhere near the hot seat. Now, if, if they lost this game against Indiana, different discussion, but they won. They won by two possessions. Defense came up clutch, and I think we can all look at that game and say there are deep concerns about Penn State, but that game more had to do with Penn State either being demoralized after Ohio State, overlooking Indiana to really put all their chips in the table against Michigan. Uh, Penn State's a much better team than Indiana. They're, they're better by, I'd say, four, five, six touchdowns than the Hoosiers, easily, especially when you factor in home field advantage. Um, for Indiana, they outgained Penn State in total yards. Indiana's defense was able to wreak havoc on Penn State's offense. Penn State, you know this, at one point in the game, I think they were two of, I think I think they were one or two of like 10, 11, 12, 13 on third down. It was nuts. Penn State went seven of 18 on third down. It's crazy. Once again, struggling on third down. And a large part of that was due to Indiana's defense. Indiana's defense was able to, to limit Ohio State and Michigan's offense at times. It really the difference maker for Michigan and why they were able to beat Indiana by so much is because they had a more mobile quarterback. Indiana was able to sack J.J. McCarthy three or four times, but McCarthy's mobility, better experience, and his amazing accuracy, arm strength, and improvisational skills allowed him to create touchdowns on what possibly could have been sacks or negative plays or incompletions, and also Michigan's offensive line, defense, etc. That that helped Michigan beat Indiana by 45 points. And for Ohio State, super conservative defense. They gave up, I think, just two field goals. Two. I think the final score is 23, 23 to 6, or I think 23 to 3. I forget exactly. The defense for Ohio State was just phenomenal. Um, But Indiana was able to limit Michigan in the lines of scrimmage. They did the same thing to Ohio State. They did the same thing to Penn State. There is so much talent on that defensive front and on the defense really overall, and it's being wasted. Tom Allen, for the previous three seasons, counting this one, for the past three seasons, has put this team into the dirt. Now, I will give Tom Allen credit. His players fight for him. They're motivated by him. Tom Allen, I would probably hire in some kind of way as like a character coach, an assistant, maybe an associate head coach. I mean, what him and Franklin have in common is they galvanize their locker room and they're good recruiters. And Tom Allen has signed some pretty high recruiting classes by Indiana standards by the way, including recruiting Desan McCullough. So I, you know, Tom Allen, I don't view him necessarily in the same regard that I do some of these other coaches who win at a higher level, 
but maybe it's because they play at a better program or coach at a better program, rather. Indiana, losing history, program that cares more about basketball than football, etc. So to a certain degree, you feel for Tom Allen. On the other side of it, whether it's horrendous game management, whether the offense just... The offense, no development at the lines of scrimmage. Quarterback play, this was the best quarterback play I've seen out of an Indiana quarterback since 2020. And guess what? They don't have enough talent at the lines of scrimmage, at running back, wide receiver, or even quarterback. Brennan Soresby, a lot of his plays were off of his wide receivers gaining separation or his offense taking advantage of busted coverages. He still threw a pick. He nearly threw another interception, and he did. I mean, he he made some plays that weren't exactly wise. Let's just put it that way. And it still was not enough for Indiana to win. The Hoosiers have lost to Louisville. They got dominated by Rutgers, blown out by Michigan, dominated by Ohio State. Indiana is one of the worst teams in the Big Ten. One of the worst teams in the country. 349 offensive yards and three touchdowns. It's probably the highlight game of Indiana for this whole season. Honestly, that's the highlight game of Indiana outside of last year's win over Michigan State since 2021, and it was still a loss. Brendan Soresby played at a great level, and he should be honored for that. And he's better than Davin Jackson in my mind, so Indiana should stick with him for the rest of the year. Tom Allen just can't win games. He can't do it. Now, Indiana, they're a a school, from my understanding, that's more focused on basketball. But at some point, you do want your football program to be relevant, especially given the fact that the amount of revenue that football draws in, it's the biggest and, I'd say, when it comes to collegiate sports, the most popular. Until March Madness rolls around, then college basketball does this really epic and weird thing where it pops into the national spotlight. It's one of the great traditions about American sports is March Madness and filling out your bracket, etc. And I think Mike Woodson is the name of the head coach for Indiana basketball. I don't know much about college basketball, if I'm being honest. He's a great coach, great basketball coach. And I think that it would be good and serviceable for Indiana, especially their future in the Big Ten, for them to have a decent football program along with a likely good basketball program. Tom Allen is not going to bring a decent football program unless he is willing to hire great coordinators and great assistant coaches. And I think Indiana has that defensively, but Walt Bell didn't work out. Rod Carey, we've seen him at, him at Temple, and we've seen him in other places. I don't think he's a high-level coordinator. So Tom Allen, I think this is his last year, and I don't know if his team has it in them to win another game after this performance. Maybe they do. Maybe they're inspired by this performance, and they go out and add two or, dare I say it, three games to their win list, and they finish four and eight, five and seven, and maybe with new schedules the following season, maybe they decide to keep them, give them one more additional year, and maybe make something out of it. I don't know. But I think he's one of the worst, if not the worst, head coach, including the interim coaches right now, in the Big Ten. Uh, Indiana versus Michigan State will be the the, the battle for absolute despair when they face off in Bloomington, I think, in Week 12. It's the the, the second-to-last game for both of those programs. For Penn State, circling back to them, I've said that term a lot, and I don't necessarily like it. A Penn State's defense is elite. I don't think that that should be drawn into question because of this performance against Indiana. Keep in mind, Michigan has had games against Bowling Green where they allowed some passes to the starting defense. Michigan's defense has allowed some deep shots to Daniel Jackson and Christian Dremel for touchdowns, and I don't question that they're elite. I think Penn State's defense is elite. Maybe the maybe the view of the secondary needs to be recalibrated. I think Ohio State has a better secondary. I also think Georgia has a better secondary. I think Iowa has a better secondary. But Penn State still has a, an elite secondary, elite linebackers. The defensive line continues to impress me more every week. The problem is they cannot hold forever. 
Look at Iowa, the team that you, Penn State fan, crushed 31-0. You're much better than Iowa. And when I make the Penn State to Iowa comparison, keep in mind that it's, when I make that comparison, I'm keeping myself, reminding myself in my head that Penn State has a lot more talent. They're still a lot better on the offense side of the ball. And perhaps they're better defensively as well due to their superior recruiting and resources. Although I think Phil Parker mans the best defensive and special team staff as well in the entire United States. But anyway, Iowa lost to Minnesota because their defense can't hold forever. That's why they lost to Minnesota. They lost to the Golden Gophers because when Minnesota is running the football and they're chewing clock and they're finding ways to get first downs, whether it's Daniel Jackson or Darius Taylor out of the backfield, whether it's Minnesota's offensive line just continuing to to, to charge forward despite being exhausted. And when Minnesota got enough time of possession, they were able to get a deep shot to Daniel Jackson. And that one play, you take away that one play, Iowa wins. That defense is elite, but the offense is so horrible. That one mistake, taking like one Jenga block out of the wrong place, and the whole tower comes tumbling down. In an imperfect analogy, that's what Penn State is like. They obviously have a better offense than Iowa. I mean, Deacon Hill makes Drew Aller look like Tom Brady with Lamar Jackson's mobility. That's how bad Deacon Hill is, and that's also... Drew Aller's still an average, above-average quarterback. He's not good, not great, not even close to elite yet, but he does have elite potential. And and you saw that with that pass to Keandre Lambert-Smith. And I think that whether it's after this game he galvanizes himself or whether it's next year after another preseason development, he'll be better. But Penn State's offense is, it's lethargic. The offense, in my mind, I, I wrote this down, when editing this video, and it it sort of shocks me reading it on the screen, but it's to a certain degree correct. I mean, they're kind of falling apart. The offense against West Virginia, it had some vulnerability, but I thought the vulnerability was just in the interior trenches. That West Virginia game, Aller looked great. The tight ends were functioning well. The wide receivers were good, and West Virginia is a decent team. They're not good, but they're decent. They might be Neil Brown's best team, and I think Neil Brown has saved his job, and West Virginia is also on offense very good in the interior trenches. So in retrospect, that didn't show badly on Penn State's defensive tackles whatsoever. That game didn't. But after that game, the offense progressively got worse. It did. Illinois looked a little interesting, especially given Illinois' performance against Kansas, and that kind of raised my eyebrow. Then Iowa, I see how Penn State beat Iowa, and I'm thinking 4.5, 4, 5 yards per play. That'll work against Iowa. That might be a very genius strategy, but that also raised some eyebrows, especially watching that game and Iowa making the amount of stupid decisions and turnovers that that did. That was one of the most undisciplined Iowa games in Kirk Ferentz's tenure, potentially, at least in the past decade. And then Ohio State, I know that's skipping over a few games, but Ohio State, Aller doesn't even complete 50% of his passes. He missed a wide open Lambert Smith that would have went for six, etc. And obviously, like Curtis Jacobs said after the Ohio State game, and I'm paraphrasing here, you know, you've got to make plays and you've got to take personal responsibility for your side of the football. But Penn State can't be relied upon to get a scoop and score against Ohio State to win that game. They can't be they, they can't rely on their defense to play perfectly to let the offense take 30 to 40 minutes to warm up before they can finally get a, a play of some kind of explosiveness. You can't do that. You know what happens if you do that and you face but Georgia, Oregon, Washington, Michigan, your defense will break. It, it, will, it will be like the Hulk snapping a 2 by 4 over his knee. That, that's not winning football. 
what Iowa does. They get wins. Penn State is bigger and better than Iowa. They do not need to be a superior, more talented version of that program. Iowa football, punting, punting is winning, is if you want to win championships, that's an oxymoron. It doesn't work. Penn State, by the way, speaking of punting, Riley Thompson's a really good punter. Alex Falcons is a near elite kicker. Like Penn State special teams off the charts. The defense, phenomenal. One of the leaders in sacks. And when there isn't a busted coverage, their secondary plays amongst the best in college football. I mean, this defense is elite. And Franklin, he knows how to recruit. Manny Diaz and Anthony Poindexter and Cider, they know what they're doing defensively. I... I look at Penn State and I just have to ask myself how how is the offense the way it is? And does that relate to Franklin? Does that more so relate to Yersich? Who, who does that fall on? I think it falls on Yersich, obviously, because he also, I think, is the quarterback's coach. And Aller hasn't performed well this year. Not nearly as well as most people anticipated. But also, Franklin's in year 10. And every year it's something. Every year, it's something, with with the exception of 2017, which was two blown games by a combined four points, which is you know, ridiculously painful. That, that team was much like Michigan's 2016 team, a lot of wasted opportunity. And a team that I thought in 2017 Penn State and 2016 Michigan were the best teams in the Big Ten that year. The problem is Ohio State had more talent and their talent compensated for a lot of their inefficiencies, and they also had an all-time elite gamer head coach in Urban Meyer who coached circles around both Harbaugh and Franklin. Penn State had four touchdowns, 342 offensive yards. They, at the end of the day, based off of talent alone, were able to capitalize more on field position, on red zone trips than Indiana did. Indiana, they missed a field goal. Penn State themselves missed a field goal, and Aller threw his first pick of the season. Um, So not a perfect game by Penn State offensively, defensively, or special teams-wise, but I'm not going to pin any of this on the defense or special teams. You can pin part of it on the secondary, but the offense has to be better. The offense has to be able to, you know, quickly get up and fire off. They have to. I saw an interesting statistic on, I think it's collegefootballstats.com or something of the sorts. It's a green icon when you look at the Chrome tab. Penn State is rated as the best second half team in all of college football. It's even after the Ohio State game. And I think what that is, is Penn State typically wears down opponents and really gets jump-started on offense in the second half. Meanwhile, the defense is able to play at a pretty consistent level. Penn State does have the potential to bully teams into submission and wear them down and break them, and I think that's what they want to do. But with the offense they have, with the offensive line more specifically they have right now, it's not working. They have to improve everywhere. The defense cannot have another game like the one they just did because Maryland, Rutgers, Michigan... Those are teams that are anywhere from better to a whole lot better by, you know, the circumference of the sun compared to Indiana. And then they will take advantage of busted coverages. They will take advantage of missed assignments. They will take advantage of an offense that, you know, can't convert on third and short and third and medium. I mean, and the amount of times that Indiana stuffed a short run, which should have been an automatic conversion, was bonkers. It was truly outer-worldly. It was. So for Penn State, I still think they're a top-10 team, by the way, because Oklahoma got upset. Yeah. Penn State, they, they didn't get upset. And Texas, they're still questionable. Alabama, questionable. I, I'm thinking of teams who I'm considering like putting in my top-10. That video will be out either tomorrow night or Tuesday morning. Penn State's still a top-10 team. And after this week especially, it seems like there's only four, five, or six teams that 
even have elite potential in college football. And off the top of my head, I think those are Michigan, Ohio State, Washington, Oregon, Georgia, Florida State. Maybe Texas if Ewers is healthy, but even then when Ewers was healthy, they had questions. And maybe, just maybe Alabama, because they're getting better every week. That's at most eight teams, and out of the six that I mentioned at first, Washington has questions, and Florida State's lack of blue-chip talent and the way they've been playing can draw some questions. To me, Florida State's either a team that's playing bored right now, and they have a high ceiling, and that's what I'm inclined to think, or they naturally are sluggish, which will come to bite them if they reach the college football playoff. That's all I have to say in this video. Thank you for watching, by the way. Remember to like, subscribe, click the notification bell, and also check out my Patreon page via the link in the description. Thanks to Spencer Bringhurst, Noah DDLC, SFS Inverted for being all American patrons. And thank you to Will Loftus, Gabriel Callender, Roaming Gnome, Matthew Sale, and Chris Lane, my all-conference patrons. If you did join the Patreon channel and your name isn't on here yet, your name will be on here starting Tuesday morning. I update my Patreon pages at the beginning of my preview and prediction video series week by week. Have a great day, guys, and I'll see you around. Bye-bye.